Jesus. Amen. You ever heard that song before? Did you know that they are referring to our Old Testament reading from Ezekiel today? Adam my bones, Adam my bones, Adam my dry bones. That's the text that we're going to study this morning. We're going to understand what the original context was, the original purpose for God giving it to the people of God at that time. Also what it means for us in our time and how we can apply the prophecy of Ezekiel to our lives today. But first, let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One quick reminder, we do have a staffed nursery in room 104 through those double doors. So um, if your child is uh, just not enjoying what's going on today and is distracting people around him or her, please consider um, room 104, the nursery. If not, if you want to keep the child in here, that's fine too. We're all about intergenerational worship until the generations can no longer hear the preacher. <laughs> and at that point, maybe consider the nursery. So who was this Ezekiel who had a vision and who prophesied to inanimate objects to bones? Well, the name Ezekiel means God strengthens or strengthened of God or strengthened by God. And that's an appropriate name for this guy. And you'll probably see this here in a few minutes. All this happened around 600 BC. That's before Jesus was born. Ezekiel was a temple priest and he was a priest for God's people of Judah, the southern kingdom. And he was in the first group of those prisoners who were taken away to captain, uh, captivity in Babylon for 70 years. He was also a prophet of God's people. And therefore, the word of the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord would come to him. And it was his job as a prophet to speak the word of the Lord to God's people. Now, it was not easy being a prophet you know, you got to say the good stuff, which is great, but you are also commanded to speak the bad news of God's judgment often. Listen to this. For the first seven years, can you imagine? Oh, here comes Ezekiel. Wah, wah, wah. The first seven years of the captivity, the Lord had Ezekiel prophesy harsh stuff, heart-rending stuff, hope-crushing words to God's people for seven straight years. You see, the people had not remained faithful to Yahweh. In fact, they had chased after idols, and they were all about the fertility cults of their neighbors living around them. 
Well, God had had enough. Not only did he allow the Babylonians to cart them off to, Bab- um, to Babylon, captivity, he would allow their pride and joy, their city of Jerusalem, to be sacked. He would allow their temple, the place of God's presence, to be completely destroyed. About 586 BC, when all this happened, is a very sad time. Well, what do you think about that? Think about this. I mean, God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. But here, we don't see a lot of that going on at this time. We see him disciplining his children. Why? Because they were unfaithful to him. So this begs the question about us and here in our time. Could we, as the people of God in 2018, could we suffer something similar if we're unfaithful to God and his word? Well, Think about it. What ways are we tempted to be unfaithful to him? What are some of those idols of our culture that sometimes we might want to put in our list of priorities above God? Kids' activities, select sports, our own leisure time, money, image, even our family members. Yeah, even family members can sometimes take the place of God in our lives. And when when that happens, we pray, Lord, preserve us from this idolatry and keep us faithful. So after seven years of God warning the people through Ezekiel, what's happened? Jerusalem and the temple are just a shambles at the hand of the Babylonians. The people of Judah have been taken away in a strange land. They're strangers in a strange place. Think about this. How would you feel if God allowed that to happen to us today? Let's say that God um, allowed the, I don't know, say the Canadians to come down and to take all the Christians in America by force and take us away to Saskatchewan for 70 years to wake us up, to repent of our sins. Think about all of our buildings now destroyed. Think about our headquarters of our denominations completely destroyed. Our seminaries abolished. If that happened to us, you know, I think that we would have a hard time having hope also. To the people of God in Ezekiel's time, it looked like God had abandoned them. They had lost all hope. But God had not abandoned them. They abandoned God. And even so, think about this. He didn't leave his people and he didn't leave them without hope either. Even when he was the one who delivered the discipline, He didn't leave them hopeless. Our Father always provides hope to his people. I remember when I was younger and my father would have to discipline me as a kid. And of course, those weren't happy times for me. No, not at all. But he was doing what he thought necessary to help me understand his authority so that I would obey God's authority. He didn't spare the the rod on me because he loved me. Foolishness was bound up in my heart. So he used the rod of discipline to drive it far from me. Often. (laughs) He didn't withhold discipline from me. He struck me with a rod, and guess what? I didn't die. He struck me with a rod to save my soul. And I know in our culture today, you say, well, you should never strike a child. God says different. Now, you never do it out of anger. You never do it out of revenge. You never do it to make yourself feel better. You must be controlled, and there's a line that you do not cross. But there are times when it can be done appropriately. God says so. You provide discipline to your child, even in a physical manner. Now, I don't know what was worse, getting the whooping from my dad or knowing that that later in that evening... He would come into my room after I was already in bed, always almost when I was almost asleep, and he came in to reconnect with me. He'd sit on the side of my bed, and he'd remind me why he had to give me that discipline. Disciple, teach, discipline, disciple, teach. It was out of, to teach me. He reminded me why he did that. But he always ended with this. Good night. I love you, boy. So after some of the worst times in my life when I was a kid, he would end it by reconnecting with me and tell me he loved me. Even though he was the one who delivered the discipline, he did not leave me hopeless. 
My dad, my father, initiated the effort to reconnect with me. He would speak words that showed me that, that I had hope in a reconnected relationship with him. You get it? Do you see how that's supposed to work? In a father-son or a mother-son or a mother-daughter, father-daughter relationship? That's the way it's supposed to work. And that's what Yahweh did through Ezekiel with his people. The Lord gave Ezekiel a vision of the valley full of dead, dry bones to symbolize God's people, all of Israel. Their hope was dead and dry. They had been taken off to Babylon. They had forgotten some of the prophets that said that they would only be there for 70 years. And for some of them, even their desire for the Lord was dead and dry. Their hope was like this. But just as God would have Ezekiel speak the word of the Lord to those bones and they would come alive, he was to speak the word of the Lord to his people, and the people would come back to life. He would raise them from their spiritual grave, you could say, and give them new life. Would you please read this out loud with me? And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. God's people would be fine. God's people would have the Holy Spirit with them. His word that he gave them through Ezekiel gave them hope. And it's that same word of God that raised Lazarus, for instance, from the dead. Lazarus, come forth. The word of God brought Lazarus back to life. It's the same word of God that raised you to your new life in baptism. I baptize you into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's that same word that raises dead churches to be alive churches once again. Huh. Would anyone ever consider the church in America to be dead? Would anybody consider this congregation to be dead? There was a pastor who was so disappointed with his congregation for many years that when he died, he requested the following words to be put on his gravestone. Go tell the church that I am dead. They should shed no tears. For though I'm dead, I'm no more dead than they have been for years. (laughs) Ouch, that would sting. Don't worry, I have no intention of putting that on my gravestone. Just the opposite. A guy named Walter Boris made the distinction between live churches and dead churches, and he says this. Live churches are constantly changing. Dead churches don't have to change, if you know what I mean. Live churches' expenses match their income. Dead churches have no vision for their offerings. Live churches are constantly improving and planning for the future. Dead churches worship the past. Live churches are intense and earnest about worship. Dead churches, of course, they're not. Live churches move out in faith. Dead churches operate totally by human sight alone. Live churches support missions heavily. Dead churches serve themselves. Live churches are filled with generous contributors. Dead churches are filled with cheap tippers. Live churches dream God-sized dreams. Dead churches relive nightmares from the past. Live churches have fresh winds of love blowing. Dead churches are full of bickering. Live churches don't have the word can't in their dictionary. Dead churches have nothing else. They don't have any other word but can't, it seems, in their dictionary. Live churches evangelize and dead churches fossilize. I praise God that the Holy Spirit, working through the word and the sacraments, has made this church, this Peace Lutheran Church, an alive church. And we should always thank and praise him for that because we give him the praise for it. It's the Holy Spirit's doing, working through the word of God and the sacraments to keep us alive and even grow us in our strength and in our life. That's That's how dead churches become live churches. Just as Ezekiel spoke the word of the Lord to the people of Israel at that time to bring them back to the land and to make them alive in Yahweh again. The people of Israel and Judah had lost God's word and they started following other gods or idols. I pray that we never, 
We never lose God's word. We never lose the Bible as God's holy, inspired, inerrant, authoritative word. And I pray, as long as I'm here, we will not worship anything but the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's God's word that raised Israel's hope. It's God's word that raised Lazarus from the dead. It's God's word that raised you to new life in the baptism. And it's God's word that will raise you from your grave on the last day. God will take your bones from your grave and he will put tendons and skin on them and he will give you a new glorified body for your new life and the new heaven and the new earth. Your bones, your bones, are going to walk around. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That while we were dead, you have made us alive, individually and corporately. Lord, I ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit that you keep us alive and growing in our faith, growing in our, our life in you. All this, Lord, we pray in the name and praising his name, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.